Hi there, and welcome to the Homestead Education Podcast. Do you have a homestead, farm, or just dream of a rural life? This is a show to help you and your kids grow your own food and grow as a person. I'm your host, Cody Hanner. I'm a homesteader, homeschool mama six, and small town enthusiast. I was raised by an old school rancher and blessed by the grace of God to have been exposed to so much of what rural life has to offer. Join me every week to talk about homesteading, homeschooling, and growth with a homestead education. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Homestead Education Podcast. Today, I have my good friend, Sophie Ng on. She is from Sprinkled with Soil and the author of The Nourishing Agent Kitchen. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you so much, Cody, for having me. Yeah, so, I mean, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? I mean, we met at a conference recently, and I just loved her story. So why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more? Sure. So I am a first generation uh, Asian American, first generation farmer, didn't think that it was acceptable in my culture to become a farmer, and it actually (laughs) isn't. We have conflicts with my parents all the time, Um, but, you know, I left a successful career in Silicon Valley, born and raised in San Jose, California. I learned how to code before I learned how to cook, and (laughs) that was just kind of standard, you know, the way that we just live and grow up over there. And uh, in 2019, I really felt a strange, you know, we were height of our careers, height of our business. My husband and I do real estate back in the Bay Area as well. And uh, I didn't know you did. I knew your husband did real estate now. I was yeah. a realtor until this year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I actually got my license in 2006 in grad school because it was either oh, wow. you were a Starbucks barista, or you just got your real estate license. So I got my that works. I got mine when we moved to North Idaho because I saw how many people were moving here. I was like, yeah. this is a job. Like, yeah. We had considered North Idaho when we were moving, thinking about moving our homestead. Yeah. So let's see. We started homesteading in 2019, essentially before you know the craziness of 2020. And um, you know, started with four small garden beds then started bringing some chickens, which they're known as the gateway animals in the homesteading world. (laughs) Next is goats. Do you have goats yet? Have you gone through your goat phase? We got, we went from chickens to goats and (laughs) sheep, (laughs) but we're down to one goat. We're trying to just get rid of them. So that's why I call it the goat phase. The goat phase. You kind of have to go through it. We, we picked them both up for 50 bucks. So it was hard to say no. And you know, they're cute. I would totally like circle back to goats when my younger kids are ready to show. So (laughs) And when we get better fencing, I think that's, that's, that was going to be the, they're liquid. Like, so you have to have airtight fencing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we, we left the Bay area and we didn't know where else to go. So we started, we bought a six acre property up in Northern, more North California, Northern, North of Sacramento and started farming there. We learned how to you know, butcher our own chicken. We went to Joel Salatin's farm. We took our RV toward the U S went all the way around. And my husband and I joke and say, you know, that's where we got our masters was when we like, you know, bought the land, learned how to farm. Um, and then 2021, uh, or 2022, when things started to get a little bit, you know, we knew what, we knew it was going to happen. So we wanted to be in a place where there was a better community because in the you know, in California and the Bay Area, it's it's hard to get people to worry about, you know, the cost of food and inflation and um, be how easy and how difficult it might be able to access food. Yep. I was in a Palo Alto yeah. in January. And that's when the height of the like egg issues were happening. Mm-hmm. And for a five pack of eggs, it was $75 at the Safeway. Are you serious? dead serious <laughs> is insane yeah <laughs> it boggles my mind well I it, if you remember this part of the presentation back in March I said <laughs> it wasn't it was the d- March 16 2020 when the all of California shut down and we locked down and had curfews and all that I ran to uh-huh. get free egg laying hens because we'd never gone through a lockdown before uh-huh. and I paid we paid three hundred dollars for each chicken so For actually for the cost. And remember I asked, like, can you calculate how much that costs per egg? But at the rate that Palo Alto was paying for their eggs, I might've just broken even. Right. (laughs) I was was shocked. And I mean, we were down there. My husband was having surgery at the VA clinic. Oh, yeah. And um, 
so yeah, I was trying to like buy food to eat in like the, uh, trying to save money by eating. They had like a, it's like a Ronald McDonald house, but it's for sp- uh, veteran spouses while the husband huh. or, you know, while the spouse, the spouse is in the hospital. And so I was trying to be smart and eat healthy and eat, you know, not fast food the whole time and save some money. And I was like, oh my gosh, at this price and it's just me eating, it is cheaper to go buy some fast food. <laughs> yeah, I know. And was that real food or was that at like a Costco? Cause I know Costco, they were having limits per. I was just going to the Safeway nearby. So, um, wow. But I ended up, I bought a container of yogurt and a big thing of pineapple and I ate that for like three days. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, this will do, you know, we're good. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I think it's still going to take some time for California to. (laughs) Right. So, you know, I think what's so interesting to me about your story is I grew up three hours from you Mm. and you say that you learned to code before you cooked. I learned to shoot before I cooked. (laughs) That's right. Okay. So you were more central California. Um, I was in Northern California. I was, I was in Sonoma County. Well, Sonoma and Mendocino County, like two hours, you know, a few hours North of the Bay area. Yeah. 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 Wine country. Yeah. But we had an 1800 acre cattle ranch where my parents were hunting guys. Love that. That's why it's such a different, you know, you get that typical, like, oh, you're from California. And I'm like, oh no, honey, I'm more rednecker <laughs> than you. <laughs> because it is such a totally different world. I grew up in cattle country. Yeah. And, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're, I think when you move out to the country, that's kind of what, cause you just don't know. Like I was mowing the lawn the other day. I had, you know, I, made sure that I was armed. And then the kids were teaching them early on. And that's something that we, we did it too in the Bay area. I think it's unique though. Cause my husband, Tim's in the military like yours. So I think we just kind of naturally want to have the kids just comfortable around it, but mm-hmm. most definitely there, we do teach our kids guns early yeah. and it's, it's the safety that goes with it. That absolutely. I mean, that's our first one. We aren't necessarily like, come on, three-year-old let's yeah. go shoot at stuff. It's, right off the bat, like you don't touch this, you know, you don't touch this part. Like if you do need to touch one, you know? Yeah. And how not, and if you're going to have to hold one, how to hold it. Mm -hmm. Cause sometimes we do have like, you know, a rifle just sitting in the front seat of the truck during hunting season and it stays there all of hunting season. Yeah. Because we might just be coming home from the grocery store and decide to take a side road. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you guys are so fun. (laughs) And I mean, we literally, it's a, 27 mile drive to the closest grocery store. Wow. Okay. So yeah, I mean, sometimes even during hunting season, the only time we get to like, you know, once we like get done working for the day and stuff, and then we have to go to town for baseball practice or whatever, that's where we get our hunting time in. (laughs) I was going to say, you might not even need to make it to the grocery store (laughs) those 27 miles during hunting season. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, everybody talks about, you know, you knew where you were on March 16th. I was getting out of the NICU with my baby. Oh, and I am so thankful that we already had our homestead established. Right. Cause we had milk, we had meat while the baby was in the NICU, our neighbors were bringing over frozen wow. meals. And so we had extra frozen meals already ready to go. And all we needed was some diapers on the way home. <laughs> And we were, the closest NICU was three hours away from our house. So we, we stopped at eight stores before we found a pack of diapers. Did it sell out? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Everything was empty. I mean, and I needed a bag of flour too. And I was like, I give up like, yeah, (laughs) that's going to happen. Right. Right. I remember that. Yeah. I mean, that was in North Idaho. And did you guys have a toilet paper shortage as well? We did, but luckily I had always done our toilet paper on subscription from Amazon. Okay. And if we don't <laughs> use it all, then we just get it next month. Like I never turn off the subscription. So we actually yeah. had a few cases already. Oh, smart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was able to come home with a stocked fridge and eat how I'd always eaten and everything was good to go. And I was so thankful for that. That is the model homesteader for sure. And I, th- I think during the presentation, I was talking about, you know, after we were driving home with those three chickens in a cardboard box, we didn't even have a chicken coop when we brought it home that day. And I remember paying what almost a thousand dollars for these three chickens. And I turned to my husband 
And I told him, I never, ever want to be in this position again, where I have to worry about feeding seven, eight people off of three eggs a day. That is like the worst stress for me. I mean, like before the call, we were talking about my impulse by cow that costs the same amount as your three chickens. (laughs) You'll get a lot more out of that cow though. (laughs) I know my, my husband said, if my son doesn't get his behavior together, we're keeping this deer and turn him for the house and because I, I bought him as a show steer for my son and you know typical teenage boys you're always on them so my husband's like if you don't get it together you're not showing this steer we're butchering it for ourselves and I'm like you're just saying that because we lost a calf last year and so we don't have another one for like next year <laughs> I love how these are the threats that country parents make <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually, I, I thought of that. I saw this homeschool post the other day that was like, when I got in trouble, my mom would ground me from cereal, cereal, <laughs> <laughs> because what else do you ground your like homeschool kids from you know, or your oh. homestead kids, you know, cause it's there. This is, yeah, that's the type of things they want to do. Like I am taking your cow away. <laughs> I know it is ridiculous, <laughs> but you know, we have normal stuff too. Like um, he got his cell phone taken away. He's 14. He does have a cell phone, you know, because he, you know, plays travel ball. Like I have to be able to get a hold of him. Yeah. yeah. But then baseball gets over and he's obsessed with watching baseball stuff on YouTube and he'll stay up all night doing it. So yeah. then his brain doesn't function. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Teenage boys. They're super fun. Do you want one? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have one. I don't have one. Um, but I've got, I've got, you know, an almost teenage, a preteen daughter. So I think it's just as challenging. Right. I, I, you know, my 14 year old daughter, she can be challenging, but she is like my biggest helper, my biggest confidant. Yeah. Like our lives wouldn't function the way they do without her. Yeah. So I she, feel that she, she's a true blessing, even on the days when I am over teenage girl hormones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we've got the exact same I mean I agree I mean she does the sourdough I mean we've taught her a lot of these things she started cooking already in the kitchen for us so when things have gotten busy she's just gone in and make a rotisserie chicken for us and oh so good but yeah then there's those hormones that it's brand new for me (laughs) I mean for me to deal with I right I've had, I've gone through mine. Well, we've already gone through the teenage boy hormones, which for the most part with that, it just starts out where their brains don't work at all. Like at all, they shut down. It is the weirdest thing. Like they suddenly forget how to tie their shoes. Like it is bad. Interesting. And then about the time the hormones start to clear out where they can function again, then they notice girls and it's a whole nother. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, I was telling you about our 18 year old it works as an electrician. We have this family rule with our teenage boys. Like, you know, before you're allowed to date, you need to be like 16. You need to have a job. You need to have your own vehicle, those types of things. We were comfortable with them dating as teenagers because we feel like that gives them an opportunity to learn healthy mm-hmm. dating while they're still in the house and have direction from us. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, especially with our daughter, we're like, we don't want you to go out in the world and have your first dating experiences without mom there to like gauge your mood and that you know? Yeah. Um, but we didn't bank on our son making $35 an hour as a 16 year old. Oh, that's really good. He's like, I have this nice truck. He's good looking (laughs) and he can afford to date any girl he wants to, (laughs) you know, we thought it would be like, he would respect his time with her more if he had to earn the money to be able to afford dinner and stuff. And yeah, it backfired. (laughs) He's got a nice girlfriend now though. So we'll see. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I'm I like, like her. Oh, that's good. She, uh, her family owns an, like an off-road four-wheeling place and she drives, she's a better off-roader than he is. So I, I dig it. Okay. That's, that's good. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and she calls him on all his BS. So it's even better. Oh, see, I like her already. Right. He's very thin skinned. Like you can't give him a hard time at all. He gets really bent out of shape and she's like, She's got like a new quip for him. Like, you know, I'm like, yeah, girl, get it. (laughs) I love it. Mama. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) So yeah, I actually, I 
I laugh so hard every time I think of this part of your story where you're like, good Asian girls are supposed to marry doctors and I married an army guy. Yeah. <laughs> so how has that been for you? I mean, because I married an army guy, but that's marrying up in my world, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like like I said, as an, I mean, anybody listening to this, if, you know, the, the Asian culture, what's acceptable is becoming a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or you marry one. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's right. You either become one or you marry one. And uh, you definitely don't marry an army guy. And and for me, it was marrying an army guy that was just about to deploy to Iraq for 18 months. He got Ooh. stuck in the surge. So a normal deployment is 12 months. Uh-huh. And in 07, 08, he got stuck for 18 months. And um, wow. we, yeah, it was, it was a challenge. Both of my parents, actually, when we were dating, I didn't even have him meet the family until a year after. Oh, just wow. kind of like, I don't know how to pitch this story to mom and dad. <laughs> like, just no good angle. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But, but I, I, they seem to accept him now. <laughs> oh, they love him now. Every time we get into an argument, are you kidding me? Like, you know, they're here for it all. So they always <laughs> take his side. They don't even know. They don't even know what just happened. Right. Because they're English, <laughs> you know, like second language. Uh-huh. They'll just automatically both take his side my dad has literally like hugged my has hugged him my husband in front of me and I'm like he's in the wrong like you guys don't even listen right. it's, so yeah I think they love him more than they love me which is fine I'll take that <laughs> right but yeah it's been oh gosh 15 years at least oh wow Maybe, yeah, yeah. It's 17 together so it's they've, they've had some time to yeah <laughs> yeah, I've been married to my husband for eight years. We've been together for nine. And um, yeah, my family still doesn't like him. So <laughs> yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's a different mentality, different lifestyle. So it takes some. It getting. is. Yeah. And, you know, the one thing I go with is my dad liked him. And then my dad passed away two months after we got married. And so I'm like, well, at least. I don't have to keep proving to my dad that he's a good guy. He thought he was a good guy from the get go. So. Yeah, that's good. And mm-hmm. I'll, I'll take that, but I, you know, to caveat on what you were saying, it is marrying up in our culture, probably. I mean, when I hear my parents talk about him in their, you know, conversations with their friends, they'll say, mm-hmm. you know, he's a West pointer. So I hear that yeah. part. Of I know I saw West point on his <laughs> like profile and I was like, oh, they can't not like that. Like that, that's a whole nother so- level. Yeah. So when they talk to their friends about him, right. And they're like, oh, and, and, you know, because of the mil- the Vietnam war, mm-hmm. they, they're familiar with West Point um, soldiers, I guess. Mm-hmm. So they have that instant respect for that, but like internally at home, I think it still was a huge, you know, he's not a doctor, or lawyer, engineer. Mm-hmm. He's <laughs> right. <a> engineer guy. <laughs> yeah. I grew up in a town of 1700 where the guy is there, you know, you go into construction yeah. Um, farming or drugs, you know, oh, I mean, that's just yeah. the three, well, I say drugs, marijuana. I mean, that's, it's literally a life. It's not even a lifestyle choice. Like that is a career choice in California. And I was never a fan of it. Like I'm not completely against, I don't know, use it for what you feel like you want to use it for. I've can, have never been able to stay in the culture. And I grew up in the Emerald Triangle, which, so, I mean, everybody there, I joke, I come from the only place on earth where the hippies hunt and the rednecks smoke pot. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. So, um, definitely. Is, that's Sonoma, yeah. Sonoma County. The well, hippies. Mendocino no more. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's exactly what it's like up there. <laughs> it's a and, really interesting culture. Interestingly, there's a a woman from Sonoma that's contacted us and she's moving out here. Oh, nice. And she, just, and she says, she, you know, she's verifiably, I, I look like I'm a hippie. <laughs> you know? She's so funny. There's a lot of hippies in that area. <laughs> <laughs> Up here, they, they call them back to landers. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> my mom and aunt came up to visit one point and they're like there's a lot of hippies in north idaho and i was like no no they're back to landers they're mountain people yeah yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's a totally different experience <laughs> so uh when you guys moved out to tennessee you you know i don't want to just jump straight to your book but i 
I love the idea of what you're doing with your book. So I would, would you mind telling us a little bit about that? And yes. Yeah. So it started actually 12 years ago when my oldest daughter was born and I started looking into what we were going to feed her after breastfeeding. So six months in, you know, you start mm-hmm. feeding solids and I had these books that were gifted from church friends and it was just normal, you know, nothing healthy books. They were just like William Sonoma books on how to cook baby food. And, uh, there were enough of these little cookbooks that said, make sure if you're trying to make applesauce to source organic. And I thought, okay, well, that's fine. I don't, you know, and in our culture that we, we go to the Asian grocery store cause it's cheaper, right? It's mm-hmm. just comical. So when I hear organic, I think of whole foods and I just think of mm-hmm. a different demographic than, than, than what I'm used well, to. I mean, I, I grew up with, my dad was a rancher and he grew up in middle Tennessee actually. So, hey. you know, organic was that's hippie food, you know, yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and so I said, fine, I I'll go ahead and start looking into organic food and I'll buy it. I'll buy organic mm-hmm. apples just for her to make applesauce. But then when do we switch her out to our food? Or are we doing it wrong? And that just led me down through this whole journey. So within, you know, a couple of months, I started, you know, I think you and I are the type that when we get into something, we start researching, <laughs> just research the heck out. You'll come out with a whole Can curriculum. Can you see right? the bookshelf? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so That's just you know, one of the like seven in my house. Oh so. my gosh. I have two sets of bookcases in the house. <laughs> <laughs> my husband hates it. Yeah. It's, it's, we have that. We don't have much else. Like it's just books. And well, I finally like, he's like very anti-book. I don't know. It's just, um, and so I finally, one day I said, if an EMP hits, how Mm -hmm. will we know how to garden? And he was like, damn it. Okay. I have a list of books. I want you to order. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And now he never complains. I mean, there's a little bit of an eye roll that I might have a problem, but okay. So I'm going to share that snippet to my husband. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. So, uh, so let's see. So we started, I started on that journey. I started looking into preservatives, you know, um, additives, and that led me, I remember this and it's, a, it's going to be in the book, but I grabbed one of those large, you know, 30 gallon black garbage bags to the refrigerator and one by one, you know, all of those Asian condiments and sauces, I just mm. went to them, flipped them around, tossed them. My mom came running into the kitchen and she was like, what are you doing? Oh no! What are we going to cook with? And I told her, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, we'll figure it out because, you know, all of the Asian food, you just go get a, a jar. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you're marinating something or it's, you know, a bottle of oyster sauce or hoisin sauce or sriracha, everything is packaged. It's, it's processed. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been 12 years ago. And wow. ever since then, my mom and I, I mean, we've cooked uh, nourishing traditions. It's, uh, by Sally Fallon. She wrote this book, big yellow encyclopedia, and it changed our lives. Uh, that's when I started, I found her book. We visited a homestead and they kind of showed us this whole lifestyle of like having dairy cow. This was out in Albuquerque. Tim was, uh, his last, um, duty station was Kirtland air force base. Uh-huh. And so there's a homesteading family out there and they, they were like, you should come over. This was before kids. Uh-huh. Uh, so, um, we went out there and that's when I started kind of like, all right, what is this raw dairy, raw milk? I tasted it. Mm-hmm. And I think it was just in my head. I was like, God, I think it tastes like grass. <laughs> I'm like, am I going to die? It's not pasteurized. Oh no. All those things that. Hey, I was a food safety specialist for 10 years. Every morning when I'd come in and check my email, it would be who died from raw milk that day. You know I mean? I was scared to death of raw milk. It's, it's insane how much we've just changed and what we were taught, mm-hmm. what we were told and how we thought that was normal. And now coming out of it, just realizing that everything was a lie, but um, <laughs> all of that to say, maybe we should do a whole nother episode just on that, but <laughs> <laughs> all food, but all that to say, like, you know, in the last 12 years, my mom and I have been refining all of nourishing traditions, food for the Asian palate. So if you're not familiar with nourishing traditions, um, it's about Dr. Weston A. Price who studied ancestral cultures. He visited those uh, indigenous areas of the world where they were the most healthy and found that they ate animal fats, they ate fermented foods. 
And so a lot of that was European. There were, he never went to Asia because uh, Dr. Price never went to Asia because uh, a lot of the food was imported back then. uh, Okay. So all that to say what we've been doing over the last over a decade is refining our dishes to make it more traditional. So things like, you know, instead of sauerkraut for fermentation, where we've really nailed down kimchi and all of the different types of ferment, like vegetable fermentation that mm-hmm. we do, and plus we're homesteaders as well. So it's one yeah. of the most preferred way for me to preserve our, our vegetables in the garden. And then, you know, things like broths, we do our broths, but we also add a lot of healing spices in there. So the pho broth, and I almost always have a pot of broth, even in the summer. If you've heard of pho, mm-hmm. that's something that we just, our family loves. And you my know, sister and niece love it. And I've never even, oh. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I've had it and didn't know what it was, but they live in San Francisco. So, oh yeah. 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 So they have the good stuff. The, yeah. the problem with that is, you know, my mom also, she's got history of atrial fibrillation. She's had a TIA, which is a, a mini stroke before. Mm-hmm. And so I've kind of nursed her back to health over the last few years and it's been through nutrition. She's gotten, she's been able to get off a lot of her medication through the, the, the way that we eat yeah. and pho, which is that broth is very healing. But when you eat it in the grocery store or in the restaurant, or if you buy it in the grocery store, mm-hmm. it's often cooked with a lot of other, yeah. you know, additives in there to make it taste nice and including MSG, which is something that I'll be talking about more. And it's going to be very controversial, but you know, I love it. I love controversial. <laughs> I do too. This is, <laughs> you know, it, I'll, you know, I'll, I'm going to put this out here for my listeners right now, being someone who writes homeschool curriculum, I am trying to reach children. Mm-hmm. So a lot of my social media and those types of things, I keep it very neutral because I don't want to take away from exactly how wonderful my curriculum can be and how eye opening it can be for anyone who has any background. Um, you know, whether it's agriculture or what their political views are, or any of that type of stuff. But when it comes to like my personal, I have all these like really controversial views and stuff. And I'm like, I can't put that out there (laughs) because (laughs) that's not what I want to share. That's, you know, and I'm not even trying to say I'm not sharing who I am because I am definitely very conservative and things like that on my uh, social media. But I don't want that to affect the fact that I'm trying to reach kids, you know, so. (laughs) Yep, absolutely. I, I feel the same way. I feel like we're alike in that aspect. It's like when you get to know us a little bit more, you're trying to hear the more controversial aspects of our thoughts. But, you know, I think it is tied to our health. I think it's tied to, you know, just going back to how we traditionally ate. Did we have MSG? Did we have a lot of the chemically processed, you know, spices or condiments or preservatives back then? And Mm -hmm. if not, then how do we cook in such a way? How do we preserve our food and prepare our food in such a way where we don't have to use any of that? And and I use that philosophy for the garden too. If we didn't Mm -hmm. have access to fertilizer, to chemical fertilizers, right? Then how do we, how do we, you know, stay self-sufficient? How do we go back to the land and use what we have? as fertilizer. So we also use a lot of our Asian farming techniques in the garden too, as well as, you know, going back to our tradition and cooking the way that we used to eat. Um, I love that. I've been following a little bit of your story on that with social media and it's gotten me really interested. In fact, my garden audio book right now is dirt that I think your husband was reading the other day. Yeah. <laughs> and my husband called me a huge nerd. Cause he's like, what are you listening to? I'm like this really great book on soil conservation. Yes. And he was like, turned around and walked away like <laughs> and he even asked me later he's like wasn't your least favorite class in college soil science like you've talked about it on multiple occasions how much you hated soil science yeah. and I'm like good. I didn't I didn't hate soil conservation I didn't hate soil nutrition and, and nutrients and stuff I hated geology like, <laughs> <laughs> it is really really boring <laughs> Well, what's fascinating about that book is my husband's a military history major. So mm-hmm. like oh, now yeah. where we are with where we, what we believe about history is really going back to, wait, what, what really happened? And, and what's interesting is, you know, now we're in soil, now we're in farming and in food and we're kind of, he's tying that together into realizing, okay, how did our ancient civilization survive and what didn't work? And tilling was mm-hmm. one of them. That's Maybe. a really big one that my um, homestead history book that I'm writing right now really looks at, and it's based on U.S. history, 
but it's what was actually happening at home sociologically with us, with food and agriculture, when that's like the biggest driving force behind everything that's happened besides money. And those are still very closely tied. Yeah. So that's where I'm writing that history book is that it can be a U.S. history for, you know, junior high, high school student that really shows what was happening on the home front. That is really good. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really great content. I'm diving really deep into that. It's a lot of fun. (laughs) But I'm, you know, I'm actually, I'm having to go through like probably the worst breakup of my life with it. And that's that my first love was agriculture. Yeah. And I'm having to like really work through a lot of, Mm -hmm. I'll read something and I'm like, oh, he's so wrong. And I set it down, you know, I walk away and I'm like, maybe he's right. (laughs) I'm back and like, I have to reread it or like set down my book and go like pull another book and research something else and be like, I want to find like where the good was when, you know, say a food safety law went into place when that was my passion for years. Yeah. So I'm actually looking for the good and not finding as much as I wish I could have. But I do understand that a lot of the people who were involved in it weren't necessarily can't even think of the word that they weren't trying to be bad they weren't trying to why can't I think of the word but anyways um like they didn't have nefarious uh nefarious the, that's what I was yeah. looking for yeah. they didn't have those that wasn't their agenda they thought they were putting the best possible thing into place but then now I look at it with all the information we have why are we still making the same mistakes mm-hmm Because we have, you know, I look at generations where there was famines and then a thousand years later, there was another famine. Well, they didn't have the written history that we have now to know, don't do the same thing again. Yeah. And now we have that. And we talk about, if you don't learn history, you're bound to repeat it. And all they look at is government and military and those types of things. And they aren't looking at the sociological aspect of it, especially in food. Absolutely. In agriculture and big food. Yep. Yeah, I think, but I think that there's a huge movement, you know, Joel Salatin says that there's this Mm -hmm. homestead tsunami that's come because of 2020. And I'm encouraged by that because, you know, there are hard, like, you know, there are hard days on the farm and just knowing that there are people moving in and there are people who understand it. I was in tears yesterday because we lost three of our purebred Hereford piglets out of our first time guilt that we've been, we got them as tiny piglets. And I've been so excited for them to have their first litters. And we lost three just right off the bat. And it was kind of my fault. And I was just heartbroken. And so I'm going to blame it more on my husband. Let's go with it was his fault. (laughs) I kept telling him, we need to put those girls in farrowing crates, like they're gilts and they're not railing up, but I think that they're due and we live cover. So I can never give an exact date. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, I think they're good. I have to go pick up some farm equipment in the next state and then I'll be home and I'll put them in farrowing crates. And I got a text at like six in the morning. I just stopped at the barn and she had her piglets out in general pop, which is where all the sows are. We have nine sows. And he's like, nobody's messing with her. So just when you get up, will you go take a look, but leave them there. We'll move them when I get home. Oh, and I'm like, okay, well, he wasn't going to be home for like 12 hours. I got up there. There was another sow that was already starting to go into labor. Like, I think it was the weather yesterday. It was, it rained like Murphy's law. Everybody goes into labor. <laughs> and so that would anyway, happen. Oh, we had, we ended up only having one litter yesterday, okay. but I have five in farrowing crates right now. I wonder if it's like the barometric pressure or something that like something I knew that they were all close, but I mean, they all like, I mean, Wow. So yeah, I, I went up, I ended up moving two into farrowing crates, but they weren't cleaned. And so I left my son up there to clean and I went back to the house and did a few things. And when he came down and said, Hey, they're ready to go. Will you come up and help me move the rest of the sows? I, and we were just leaving her be with her babies because nobody was bothering her. And we had a little bit of hay around her to block the rain. And I went back up and one of the other sows had laid down on the hay and killed three of the piglets. Oh. And I just was like, I was heartbroken. And then I'm like, my husband told me to leave him and I listened to him and I was like, oh, well, you're a big girl. You could have made that choice too. You know, I know, I know we've had that too with our lambs when I was like, Hey, mm-hmm. it looks like the sheep, the user are about to deliver and you know, we should probably separate them. And he's like, how are we going to do that? Cause they're out, you know, they're out. Mm-hmm. They're out right now. And so we didn't, but then the dog ended up attacking one of um, the, the, the use probably when she was delivering Oh, so, wow. yeah. So, yeah, you know. it's hard days. I mean, we have nine sows. We go through about 250 piglets a year and we probably lose 25 of those. 
250 I mean, it's, but wow yeah okay. so I mean it's it happens it's real we lose sometimes we'll lose whole litters we lost a whole we lost a litter of 17 this year oh ouch yeah so I mean it's hard to see it it's hard on our finances sure. but I wouldn't change my decision to do this for anything yeah <laughs> A thousand percent agree with you. (laughs) It's worth, it's worth it all. And I even, I was talking to someone online about that yesterday and they're like, what's the hardest part about raising animals? And I was like losing them. And they're like, but aren't you also eating them? I was like, I have respect for them. Yeah. It's not the same. It's definitely not the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We, we lost our, our first dairy cow during the deep freeze. And I think her immune system was already weak because we had two others and they were just fine. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, that was a tough one. It took us a while to, to bounce back from that because, you know, it's an 800 pound. It's not, it's not the same as a chicken. Yeah. No. That you lose. So, yeah. But yeah, when I can sell my purebred piglets for 300 a piece. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. 17. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that hurt, <laughs> but I mean, it was hard to you know, just losing them in general. It's hard yeah. to just have all that waste. And I know my daughter, she came up with a good plan though. She, they, she, the mother had rolled over on them. Mm-hmm. And so they had no other, like they weren't sick or anything like that. She went out and gathered them all up and froze them and donated them to the local 4-H of vet science. Oh, so the kids could all dissect fetal piglets this year. That is so cool. Yeah. It's like, and she even called the local 4-H leader and was like, I gathered them all up and froze them individually for you. And is this something you would like? And she was like, yeah. And so my daughter got put them all in an ice chest and we took them to town. And so, you know, when we lose one or two, a lot of times they just get thrown away or, you know, it just is what it is. We lost a litter before. And I, it some, I mean, some people don't like to hear it, but I boiled them and stripped the meat and fed it to the dogs. Mm -hmm. Cause I didn't want the dogs to know that you can eat like a whole piglet, you know, but I didn't want to see that much go to waste. Yep. Yep. So it's just one of those things that it's the hard part about homesteading, but I almost feel better after I make a choice like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I know that we're like keeping the protein on the farm and we're, yeah. everything's going full circle. Right. And if the animals weren't sick themselves, it's mm-hmm. still usable meat. Yeah. Especially for the dogs and they're, they're getting really good meat. Mm-hmm. And our dogs do a good job of protecting our homestead. So that's their job. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> our great Pyrenees, he's losing his mind right now because our meat birds keep getting out of their enclosure and he like sits out there like all night long trying to keep them safe I guess that's so good I know I'm like poor ranger like they'll all be butchered soon you're fine because <laughs> we just have them in like a the hot wire netting yeah yeah and they get out but they're so big they can't even run you know <laughs> but yeah. so yeah I actually I think what really draws me to your story with you know trying to meet the food of your culture is and this might sound really weird, but you know, like mine and my husband's generation, we grew up with all packaged food. Mm-hmm. That was the culture of our mothers. And I'm yeah. sure you had that too. I mean, you talked about cleaning out your fridge. And even though I grew up ranching, we had a lot of our own meat, but everything else, I mean, it was, you know, fried, fried venison with boxed mac and cheese. I mean, this was not a healthy meal. Mm-hmm. But I thought that that was how you ate. I don't want to say that's, I never thought fried was healthy, but I mean, that's what you ate. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was normal and that we were the extra healthy people because we killed all of our own meat. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, the only way we cooked it was breaded and fried. Like literally that's the only way my dad cooked venison and the only way my mom cooked venison. (laughs) And I mean, I look back on that now and I use the whole animal for every meal. I mean, we're tacos and soups and uh, mm-hmm. Salisbury steak. I mean, everything that we would normally do, I can do with venison and it tastes great. Yep. Um, but the biggest problem we had is when my husband got diagnosed with liver disease, mm-hmm. we had to go all natural, you know, like that was, well, they pretty much told him, put your, get your affairs in order. We don't know how long you have. Wow but you can probably extend or have a better quality of life if you start eating more naturally. 
Okay. Um, At least they, they think said that. that. Yeah. Um, they said that that's the only cure for liver disease. Okay. Pretty much is, I mean, quit drinking, quit smoking, be off medications, lower salt and healthy eating. That's like the only things. Yeah. Now, I mean, we didn't do drugs. Um, we didn't smoke at the time. Um, we did, you know, Friday nights, we would buy a six pack of beer and barbecue and stuff, but we cut that out. Um, and then through food and natural supplements, I have him off of all of his medications. And when he had his surgery in January, they did a liver biopsy and they were like, and they looked at his liver while they were in there. And they said, we see a little bit of cirrhosis on the edges, but other than that, you have a 100% healed liver. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Incredible. I mean, I get like, like, you know, cause it was, it's been a hard several years. Yeah. That's not easy. Um, He was almost seven years ago. He got his diagnosis now. Wow. And it changed him as a person. He was not happy. He wasn't happy in life. He wasn't happy with himself. And he was like, you know, they take away, I can't have a beer. I can't Mm -hmm. eat like junk food. Like what else do I have to even live for? You know, I mean, he's like, I have the family, but like we, it's just, everything sucks. He's like, I spend time with the family. And then I'm mad that what if this is our last hiking trip together or something, you know? And, um, so for him, I had to mimic all of his foods to still look like what we had always eaten. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, you know, like I said, I, I thought we were pretty healthy eaters. And then I realized that we really weren't. Mm -hmm. And so I have been recreating what our diets look like. Great for years so that we can still have all the things that we've always had natural. Yeah. And I do it in layers. You know, it's first, you know, like taco seasoning. I know it sounds really dumb, but it is really is nice. We grew up when you made tacos, you had a packet mm-hmm. and you dumped that packet into your taco meat and that's what you ate. Well, you know, at first we're like, okay, we'll just season our own meat and it didn't taste the same. The same. And so I have now perfected taco seasoning to taste like the packet. But, and now that I've done that, I buy bulks, like organic spices. And now that I've done that, now I'm working on one at a time. I grow them and (laughs) I grow them and make them myself, you know? Yeah. We've been on the same journey. (laughs) (laughs) It's that layer. And, you know, then that's, you, you know, you've gotten to the point of a cookbook. I am not there. I've, I have a small one. That it's just, I'm putting those recipes out because I know that there's so many other people going down those same journeys. Yeah. And for some, it's really easy. You know, I, I always think like I have a family friend that like the kids were excited to have cottage cheese and peaches for dinner. And I thought, gross, who eats that? You eat meat and potatoes for dinner, you know? (laughs) And so there's families, there's people that for them, you know, like we've always eaten salads. So now we're going to switch to organic salads. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's a much easier transition than for people who, that that wasn't the way they grew up. That wasn't the way they always ate. And to be able to slowly work ourselves into that healthy eating and being able to have it still look like what we've always eaten. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Taste, taste like what it's, we've always eaten, you know, exactly needs to taste it. It needs to be simple, especially, you know, and that's what I've been working with my mom too. Like, it's great, but I don't have all day for the kitchen. So can we just cut this down to 30 minutes in the kitchen? Right? And that was, that's my it. husband was so unhappy that then at the end of the day, I serve him dinner that doesn't look like anything he's ever eaten before. And it tastes weird and has no salt. Yeah. That was really hard on him. Yeah, And to be able to make it something that he wants. And then, like you said, I, I, I didn't have all day to be cooking. And that was, that was where I was at. Yeah. And so now over the years, I've perfected it where we have batch cook days or we have things that I'm always cooking broth. Like you said, you know, probably yeah. once a week or once every other week, I'm doing a batch of broth Yeah. and I don't like canning broth. And so I just mm-hmm. make enough for what we're going to use. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's just easy. I mean, once I have it going, I mean, I just take it back out during the day and the kids, they can feed themselves whenever, you know, they're, they're so it's nice, but yeah, it sounds like we've been a very, we've been on a very similar journey over the last few years Most and, definitely. Glad, and, and it's, it's usually, you know, I mean, that was kind of the impetus of, of the book 
it, it actually didn't start off as, you know, Hey, I should write this for the masses. This was a family project that I've a passion project of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I work in startups, so it's typically easily 80 hour weeks. That's just the, the level of work that I do and the specialty that I do. So it lends well for startup life, but you know, it, it can wear on you. And so I took some time off in September and my husband, I was like, should I take some time off until December and, and then start looking again? But he said, why don't you just take some time off? And mom and dad are in their mid seventies now. Mm -hmm. Um, their mental health is starting to wane. My mom's health to her memory is starting to go a little bit. And so he said, just, you know, spend the time with mom and write down her stories, mm -hmm. write down the recipes oh. and learn the techniques. And I mean, we've been cooking side by side. Well, I'm sure you're learning that living in Tennessee is a big cost difference than San Jose. It is. it is. So it can afford us the time, honestly, to, for me to take a step back from having to work so hard, but I'm still <laughs> working pretty hard. <laughs> Um, yeah. I don't, this, this is me being a stay at home mom. <laughs> this is just, yeah, it's a little crazy, but all that, you know, that was September and then October Chelsea green publishing company is, I mean, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with like half of our books in our bookshelf is Chelsea green's books. Yeah. <laughs> and so they heard our story and, um, you know, they encouraged me to get back on social and start, you know, sharing the, the building the platform so that, you know, we could work on a book together. And I was just, I'm honestly amazed that anybody even wants to support this cookbook because this really is just for, it was just our family project. It's something that I wanted to preserve for the kids, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And if any, if they were willing to come in on it, then great. That means more people would have access to it. And for me, then my mission is now fine. Um, I've gotten so much like great feedback on people saying, yes, this is exactly what we want. We love Asian food. We just haven't mm -hmm. been able to eat out. And that's the part that kills me because I think it's a really beautiful journey. It, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I want people to start questioning what you're putting, what they're putting in their bodies. Um, and just, you know, we've gone, you and I have gone through that journey. We've gone through a painful journey of realizing, Hey, we need to take a couple of steps back and really kind of clean this up a little bit, because once you learn what's allowed, um, legally from the government, you kind of just have to go, okay, well, that's not what I thought I signed up for. So let me try to clean this up and, you know, support your local farmers or, or start doing it yourself on, even on a small scale, grow a tomato plant yep. <laughs> and, and you can, you can taste the difference for us. It started with, you know, pho. We, again, I talk about pho a lot. That's what we do. It's a base food. So the base food. Um, and I started with a, you know, little windowsill, a little patch of cilantro and onions. That was it. And that was for my mom. Cause she said, don't even, this is, this is how Asian moms talk. Don't even bother making pho. If you don't have onions or cilantro, she still says that to this day. And I'm like, I have it right here. I grew it. Like <laughs> she's still saying it. And, and it's true. And then when you have it from like, when you're growing it and it's fresh, mm -hmm. put it in the broth. Honestly, I could just drink that broth with the cilantro and the onions and I'm good. Like, right. Better than, cause you can't, I wouldn't encourage you to drink that in a restaurant. It's they've got so much stuff in there that you know, is really questionable. Well, there's this silly little song that says there's two things in life that money can't buy. And that's true love and homegrown tomatoes. <laughs> that's right. I did hear that <laughs> one recently. <laughs> and it is so true. And I mean, it's just that, you know, it goes beyond the tomatoes, but mm -hmm. um, I will eat a carrot from the store a lot faster than I'll eat a tomato from the store. Just put yeah. that one out there. Cause they're gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I'm the person like in the store like even in the local section we have a local section at our okay. grocery store and I'm smelling all the tomatoes because I'm like I'm not gonna buy it if it doesn't smell like a tomato <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> I mean we still want fresh tomatoes in the middle of winter and I just don't have yeah. that type of setup I mean you guys are in Tennessee you probably have a little bit longer growing season yeah till October but we actually mm. we we freeze them and then we've just started freeze drying them from last year but we're right. out, like we're completely yeah. out now. So now I probably have another month before these tomatoes ripen, right. but I'm See, so I was just able to put my tomatoes outside. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So they're like this thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How, I'm how... looking at August before my first tomato. Okay. There you go. 
August. Yeah, we're well, probably about a month ahead. Not yeah, too, too far. That's, that's <laughs> nice. But yeah, I mean, it's. I, I see your book doing really well, and the reason that I, I mean, there's so many immigrants and second, third generation families who've lost those traditions that with this, you know, what did Joel Salatin call it? The homestead tsunami. He did. I call it a learning revolution. That's what I've, I say in all my speeches is uh, that COVID caused a learning revolution. Absolutely. And it's not just about the homesteading it's, you know, government. And I mean, just all of our systems in general. Right. And absolutely that's trickling out. But like you've said, you know, your base food pretty much is pho. And if you can't provide that for your family, how can you do the rest of your foods? Mm -hmm. And it just takes it from there. And then there's even people like me who go there. There's not even a Chinese food restaurant in my County. Yeah. And well, okay. There is one, but they served us wontons with ketchup. Yeah. <laughs> and I decided that that just wasn't Asian food. <laughs> like, I was and like, no, no, that's not it. <laughs> we, but so th- what's interesting though, is ever since eating this way and growing it ourselves, almost, you know, we're at a hundred percent of our protein is, is grown right. or if not hunted, our vegetables were so- finally starting to get a little bit better this year. Our, last yeah. year was our first year here. So I'm truly, really, really trying to disentangle our family from the system. Mm-hmm. But when we recently went back, cause I shot the photos for the cookbook in Hollywood. Oh, wow. um, and so those, I mean, we were able to eat there. Mm-hmm. We went to the grocery store there, but the food there, which is known for Asian food, it is really, really mm-hmm. the hub of like Korean food, uh, Vietnamese, Chinese, everything, all of the cultures are there mm-hmm. and represented it didn't taste good. Oh, and no. for the places that we used to frequent, cause you know, we're uh-huh. in California, we would often go down to LA for a foodie trip. Like we were just, okay, oh, we're going to some really good killer, all you can eat Korean food. And so we would just pack up, drive seven hours, go down and eat and then come back. <laughs> like that's just like, we're major foodies. And I kid you not the food now. And it's funny because we, we sat at some of these restaurants and we, we thought, well, maybe they changed management. Maybe the ownership changed. Maybe they hit hard times, but there's still a line full of people waiting. Oh, wow. So it isn't that it's our taste buds. It's the Mm -hmm. way that we have changed and what real food should taste like that we can tell that it's not good. And it's so interesting because my husband and I, we went on a, on a date trip, right. And we, we Mm -hmm. felt it. And then on this, on this trip with my mom to take the photos in Hollywood, she went with me. And she said the same thing. And I never told her about what my experience was. And I told her, oh, okay, wow. well, then you confirmed it. We have, our taste buds have changed. You know, I see that all the time because we most, mostly at home. And then when we do eat out, we live in a really small community, like 15,000 people in our whole County. And all of the restaurants here are all local foods and yeah. that style of cooking. Yeah. And we, we travel a lot. I'm in a different state every other weekend. And whether I'm going to the grocery store or going to a nicer restaurant or even grabbing fast food, because I've been on my feet for 14 hours at a convention, none of it tastes good to me. Yeah. I just, I cannot wait to get home and the water, the water kills me. Yeah. I drink well water and only well water. (laughs) And I go on these trips and I actually get dehydrated because I can't drink water on the road. And I mean, I will there are some bottled waters that I'll choose over other ones, but yep. it's still, it's really hard to keep that much cold bottled water on me to be able to stay hydrated. Yeah. I mean, the ice, when I, you know, I have my cup, my tumbler cup that I take everywhere and the ice all tastes weird. Ah, uh, yeah. That's, and that's like genuinely hard on me to get hydrated on these trips. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I've heard about, I've heard about that. I've, I've been with someone who literally said, I can't get hydrated and I keep drinking all this water. And mm-hmm. she was, we were at an event in Asheville. Um, and she's like, normally said the same thing. Normally I'm on, I'm on well water. She's out of Spokane mm-hmm. and oh, yeah, we're just North of Spokane. So yeah. Yeah. You guys must be spoiled with your clear, fresh water out there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And I mean, like the, you, I can taste the chlorine even in the ice and it'll give me heartburn. 
And so I'll purposely rent hotel rooms that have like the mini kitchens in them so that I can buy bottled water and make ice out of it. Oh my goodness. Like it's literally that worth it to me. I'm not like a real spoiled stuffy yeah. person. It's just, I, I mean, I literally, I drink out of our hose most of the time at home. Wow. Doesn't, I mean, I just don't have that type of personality, you know, and I am so spoiled when it comes to my water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but a, yeah. All right. So as we're coming to the end of our time, I, the, my favorite question for all of my guests is what does keep growing mean to you? Uh, keep growing, keep learning, mm-hmm. keep learning. It is, you're right. This is the learning revolution and, and it's picking up skills um, and not being afraid to, to fail because even, even if you're failing, you're still testing and you're trying and you'll, you'll Love iterate that. the next time around, it'll get better. And when you keep doing that over and over, you know, when, when it comes to cooking, you know, trying this recipe out, it might not taste right the first time, but just keep trying and same thing in the garden first year, not so great. All the pests are eating everything, but to year two, year three, as you keep trying, putting things out there and amending the soil, you know, less, less is required over time, but just keep going. I would say keep doing it until it no longer feels like work. It feels like life. Yes. So. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that. Uh, so do you want to tell everyone where they can find you, where they can pre-order your book, all those wonderful informations? Yeah. So you could find me on Instagram at sprinkle with soil. It's like sprinkle with salt, but we also talk about, you know, at the finishing touch, we also talk about soil a lot food and farming. Uh-huh. And uh, you could find us on Substack and, and sign up for our newsletter. So that's sprinkle with soil dot And then for pre-ordering the book, it should be out in December, but you can pre-order now and wow. you can find us on Amazon as the nourishing Asian kitchen. Okay. And I will be sure to link all of that in the show notes. Oh, wonderful. Thank Thank you. you. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on today. I've been so excited for this ever since we met and I can't wait for people to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, Cody. Thanks for inviting me on the show. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today at the Homestead Education. And I hope that I have given you something to think about this week. To help others find me, please comment and leave a review on your favorite podcast player. You can also follow me on Facebook at The Homestead Education and Instagram at homestead underscore education. Do you have questions that you would like answered or just want to say hi? Please email me at hello at the homesteadeducation.com. Until next time, keep growing.